Ashfield program has grown significantly as has everything else there. Uh, so welcome, John. We look forward to hearing some pearls and words of wisdom from you this morning. John, are you muted? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, um, so I'm gonna be doing uh, critical care pearls today. Uh, I figured we start it off with a story. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about a case of a medical student um, who no, as all medical students do, spend hours doing research trying to get into residency. And one day she starts feeling a little short of breath. And so she calls, calls um, a cab, goes home and um, watches a movie that night. And then she has a sensation of impending doom while she's watching a scary movie. At the same time, uh, her fiance thought, you know, this is a good time to propose. So then she starts to her heart racing a little bit as well. And obviously the next day she goes and tells her research attending what happened and who attributes all this to anxiety and cold feet because of the engagement. And I'm, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip forward and tell you that the case that I'm talking about today and what we thought we'd focus on is about venous thromboembolism or VTE, which is a combination of DVTs or PE. If you look at the national, um, the global trend, you know, throughout the years, all the countries have had an increased incidence of diagnosing um, DVTs and PEs, and the case fatalities have been decreasing. Uh, part of this is usually due to you know increasing age of the population, but also because of uh, the readily available CTAs and, and D-dimers are now everywhere. So there is a component of overdiagnosis. So you do increase your denominators and does uh, affect your case fatality rate. Some of the risk factors for DVTs and PEs, you know, as uh, part of birth child's triad, you know, there, there are some things that we consider weak risk factors and things like uh, bed rest and immobility, right? If you're, you know, in a prolonged car or uh, air travel, and you know, in this case, uh, studying and researching, uh, this is a weak risk factor, as opposed to some of the moderate risk factors. Uh, we have things in the ICU like blood transfusion, central lines, uh, heart failure, respiratory failures, and the strong risk factors are usually all the orthopedic surgeries, the major trauma, MI, spinal cord injuries. These are what we consider the strong risk factors. A little bit about the signs and symptoms of uh, PEs and DVTs. They're, they're a little nonspecific, uh, often chest pain and dyspnea. Uh, you could have hemoptysis if uh, you have uh, distal infarcts that causes a pulmonary infarct. Uh, parts of the history that are usually uh, red flags for us or uh, if you have pre-syncope or syncope, that kind of shows that, you know, your body can't really take a joke and you have to be very cautious about the blood pressures. Uh, sometimes when people have this sense of in impending doom, that's usually in all, you know, pathology, that's a bad thing because they're usually right. And diaphoresis, you know, because it's very... Uh, pretends that your body is releasing a lot of epinephrine to keep you alive, so you do have diabetes. Um, other more worrisome things, hemodynamic instability, signs of hypoperfusion, and bradycardia is usually the precursor to bradyacystotic arrest, which is usually the cause of death for these PE patients. A word on D-dimers. Um, you know, D-dimer is released when you have thrombosis and then you have the activation of the fibrinolysis system. But it's, uh, it's very sensitive, but not very specific. So it's easily elevated. It's uh, definitely not a great test to use in the ICU. So we 
usually don't rely on this in the ICU to diagnose DVTs and PEs. It's really mainly for outpatient uh, uh, to come into the ER who really have a low pretest probability, and then you will use it. Um, so adjust the age cutoff greater than 500. There are these uh, rules. This is probably the most commonly used score, the well score. And basically, it kind of um, test uh, shows your pretest probability for PEs. Uh, this is from MD Calc. Uh, you can see a, a combination of questions that they're asked, and each of them are weighted a little different. Some were worth three points, one point five, one point. Um, if you add everything up, you can either get a low probability, moderate, or high probability. Or the modified wells to make it simple is just greater than four or less than four, make it unlikely or likely. Uh, one of the things you know it, it says right here, you know, from the creator itself is you know never never do the D dimer first, right? The monster in the box is that the D dimer is done first, and it becomes positive as is in many patients with non VTE conditions, and then the physician assumes that VTE is now possible. All right. So this is a overall general um, workup algorithm for low suspicion TEs um, who come into the ER, right? You you assess them, you get a history, you use your clinical judgment, or you use the Wells rule and to decide whether the patient uh, is likely a PE or not. If your probability or your um, suspicion is low to intermediate, then you can use the D-dimer as your first test. And if it's negative, you can stop. If it's positive, then you keep going. However, if you have a high suspicion of PE, then regardless of what the data dimer shows, you're going to go straight for a CTA. So that's where we go straight for the CTA. So going back to our medical student, right? Um, eventually, she makes her way to the ER, um, and this is her CT angiogram. I'm going to point out um, that you can see, oops, the um, sorry. You can see the clot in the pulmonary arteries right here. And so this is a large almost saddle P that she has. And also we get a echocardiogram and sometimes on a CT, you can also look at the heart. What things that we're looking for is really a dilated right ventricle. So you can see that this is the right ventricle right here, which is markedly bigger than the left ventricle. I'm not sure why my pointer is doing that, but in any case, oops, sorry about that. In case we can do a, uh, best eye ultrasound. This is the apical fortune review, and we see that the right ventricle is, you know, almost the size of the left ventricle, if not bigger. And that is usually uh, suggestive of RV strain uh, from the PE. And when we have that, that is usually a high risk mortality patient. Other predictors of mortality that we can get, uh, we we look at BNP, and usually when the BNP is greater than 100 in meta analysis, it shows that it does increase your risk of mortality by 6%, uh, sorry, six times the mortality risk. Uh, this is due to myocardial stretch. Proponent elevation increases your mortality by five times, and a lactate greater than two is when your risk of mortality significantly increases. So these are usually the three labs that we would get for our PE workups. Now for uh, clinical assessment, uh, there is the pulmonary embolism severity index, and you can see there's a myriad of uh, variables here, and each of them are given a different weight, and basically based on how you calculate it, you get either a class one and two, which is defined as low risk, and class three through five is high risk. Although this is very hard to use just because of all the variables, and each of them is different weighted. So we actually more often use the simplified uh, Pepsi. And this, everyone is weighted one score, one point, and there's only a few questions that you can answer quick and dirty. And 
if you have none of these, if your score is zero, then you are considered a low risk PE. If you have uh, even one of these points, then you're considered high risk PE. So to kind of put it all together, uh, when we see our patients, we kind of assess, you know, are they hemodynamically stable? What is their PEPC score? And do they have any uh, RV dysfunction, any um, cardiac uh, enzymes being released? So if you are a low risk, then we, most of the time we can uh, potentially just discharge the patient home on anticoagulation. If you are considered a high risk based on the PEPC score, then you are term intermediate or submassive. And based on whether you have RV dysfunction or um, cardiac enzymes, you're either considered intermediate low or intermediate high. So if you're in intermediate low, you're going to be treated mostly with heparin drip or Lovenox and eventually transition to a DOAC. Most of the time, you can uh, do pretty well in a uh, step down uh, monitoring setting. However, if you are intermediate high, so you are having RV dysfunction, you have enzymes. So you, this is uh, really where the PERT team, uh, the PE response teams are very beneficial because they um, will, you know, you get IR, you get uh, CT surgery, and they kind of all huddle to kind of decide what is the best path forward. You know, so in my mind, this is kind of like the LVO champs patient that we have uh, where they get mo transferred to a, surgical capable center and get monitored for deterioration. And, um, and if they become um, symptomatic uh, to a point that they qualify for surgery, they will go for surgery. And then the high risk, which is by definition, anyone with hemodynamic instability that is called massive PE or a high risk PE. So this is the only time uh, in PEs that you qualify for TPA. And if TPA doesn't work, you're uh, evaluated for either mechanical thrombectomy versus suction embolectomy. So a lot of this, in my mind, it, you know, I kind of think of PE similar to strokes, the, the management-wise. Um, just a little comparison. For stroke, the TPA dosing is 0.9 mg per kg with 10% as a bolus, and the rest infused over one hour. And you can give that up to 4.5 hours. In pulmonary embolism, uh, the time window is much longer, but most beneficial is given within the first two days. If you have someone that is crashing, that is coding in front of you because of PE, usually we do a 15 milligram bolus and we should continue CPR for you know up to 60 to 90 minutes to, so that you can circulate the TPA. Um, in the non-ACLS patient, the one that's just high risk, if, uh, you kind of go by weight, but in this case, you, you basically give the whole 100 milligrams. So you give 10 milligrams as a bolus and the rest as a two hour infusion. And you can afterwards, after the TPA is done, uh, you bridge them to heparin drip, uh, which is the standard uh, pulmonary embolism uh, management algorithm. One of the things, you know, we, we had a few neurosurgical patients that um, sometimes get PEs afterwards and, you know, after brain surgery, you don't really feel very comfortable with 100 milligrams of TPA. Um, some, some, there's a lot of study and there's actually a move in the literature where they, they kind of wonder, you know, 100 milligram was really an arbitrary number that was chosen. There's good studies that show, you know, half dose or even quarter dose TPA uh, does seem to do uh, have similar efficacy. So that, that may be something uh, to consider if, you know, we don't, uh, really feel very comfortable with 100 milligrams. Now, if IV TPA doesn't work, you know, we have catheter direct directed thrombolysis where you put the catheters into the bilateral pulmonary arteries and you can infuse TPA about a milligram an hour for 24 hours. Uh, there's really no uh, randomized trial that's been published yet, uh, and that's undergoing. You know, in, in you know, yes, we do. We did do some of this for stroke at one point. You know, I, the the thing in my mind is, you know, when you give IV peripheral TPA, you know, a hundred percent of what you're given 
has to go to the lung, right? Which is kind of the seems uh, to do the same thing as uh, catheterized thrombolysis, you know, as opposed to the 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 brain, where if you give IV TPA, you know, only 20, 25% of your cardiac output goes to the heart. I'm sorry, it goes to the brain. So it kind of seems that giving IV versus going through IR to get these catheters, you, you might get the same benefit. But there's a trial on the way. And then, of course, uh, you know, thrombectomy, right? Um, you, you have to go on Twitter if you're doing thrombectomy, right? And we do have uh, the PERC team at Mount Sinai who does a lot of these um, pulmonary embolism thrombectomy cases. Uh, there's really two big um, systems right now, the penumbra aspiration and the inary flow retriever, which is in the picture on the bottom left. Um, you know, I think they're a little bit behind from the thrombectomy of stroke. So there, you know, there's a lot of trials ongoing. Uh, so they're still waiting for the, you know, the 2015 year that we had for stroke. However, you know, it's the, 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 the flow retriever seems to be pretty promising so far, but uh, everyone's collecting data. We're looking for the trial to come out. And then lastly, you have um, embolectomy, uh, which by itself carries, you know, uh, as published a uh, mortality rate of about 10%. So it is really reserved for very high risk patients um, where you put them on pulmonary, cardiopulmonary bypass and you incise the two main pulmonary arteries and uh, suck out the fresh clots. And there's no data comparing surgical embolectomy versus mechanical thrombectomy. However, you know, um, as the as the technique and the the equipment improves with the mechanical thrombectomy, you know, it, it feels like it will eventually uh, outshine the surgical arm. But we're still waiting for data on that. And of course, you know, we can't talk about PEs without talking about DVT prevention, which is basically um, the cause of all these, right? So uh, PEs, they usually come from lower limb DVTs. They rarely come from upper limb. And once in a while, we, we do find these calf vein DVTs, which uh, by itself, they rarely embolize to the lung. And most of them kind of resolve spontaneously without any treatment. Uh, but we do have to monitor them, uh, probably get a serial dopplers just to make sure it goes away and it doesn't extend. Because if it does extend into the proximal vein, then you're at the risk of the DVT. Uh, other questions that, you know, we, we often ask ourselves, you know, if you're going to use DVT prevention, do you use Lovenox? Do you use Hepin sub Q? Uh, or do you use anything at all? Do you just ambulate them and, and, um, and not expose them to heparin for the bleeding risk, right? So a, a few, you know, there's been actually many papers uh, published uh, with mostly meta-analysis even um, so here is a journal from the hematology literature, which compared uh, all the uh, randomized trial comparing Lovenox to Hep sub Q, and it, this one was looking at uh, incidence of HIT. Right? So once in a while, we do have one or two cases of HIT in the, uh, a year, and it does show that Lovenox, you know, amongst all these studies, there was only one case of Lovenox that caused HIT and 31 cases of HIT in um, heparin sub-Q. So it, the, the data is pretty clear that Lovenox uh, by itself uh, leads to a very low risk of hit compared to unfractionated heparin. A uh, question about, you know, is it safe in neurosurgery? So there is, um, this is an older study, a, a randomized trial, multicenter trial that compared Lovenox 40 milligrams starting 24 hour post op uh, for seven days minimum versus the standard, which was um, mechanical, um, the, the sequential compression devices for the legs and mobility. Uh, most of these patients, these are all elective, most of them were intracranial tumor resection. And in terms of DVTs and PEs, you know, clearly a uh, reduction in DVT with Lovenox and reduction in PE with Lovenox. And there was no major bleeding in this, at least in this uh, randomized trial. 
there was uh, some more uh, minor bleeding, which was classified as surgical wound hematoma. So overall, the data in, in this one randomized trial shows that Lobanox after elective tumor resections, uh, they do decrease the risk of VTEs while substantially increasing bleeding risk. Here's a, another one uh, in year 2000 where they looked at four randomized trials uh, on the same question comparing uh, heparin to placebo, which was none. Uh, overall, a 45% relative risk reduction and the number needed to treat about seven. So basically, uh, you, you are exp um, at risk for one additional VTE for every eight patients that uh, do not get prophylaxis. And overall, the number needed to harm uh, to cause increased bleeding is in the order of hundreds. So there was really no significant increase in bleeding risk in, amongst all these uh, randomized trials in neurosurgical patients. And lastly, you know, at the more recent uh, 2018, they did an updated meta-analysis um, in, in the journal JNS. This included nine prospective RCT studies in neurosurgical patients, of which six were comparing Lovenox versus placebo, uh, which is uh, the mobility and SCDs. First, and then there was three that were uh, sub-Q heparin versus placebo. Uh, once again, overall, 42% uh, relative risk reduction number needed to treat of 11 to prevent one DVT and no significant increased hemorrhages or bleeding complication noted amongst all these trials. So this is something that we think about. Um, and, you know, to, to finish, um, the medical student survived and made it into residency. And, you know, she is a big proponent of Lovenox based on all these studies. And I think that's uh, where I was going to leave it at the end for any questions that you may have. Thank you, John. Any questions? John. I, I had a quick question. Did any of those yeah. trials look at the differences in hemorrhage risk on DVT prophylaxis for different types of procedures? I, I'm not sure they had the numbers to analyze that, but I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, most of them um, were, you know, a majority of them were elective neurosurgical cases. Um, so just the one that I, I can recall, at least this one, this was uh, the one randomized trial. Uh, this was about 90% of them were intracranial cases, about 10% of them were uh, spinal cases. Uh, all these were elective and um, majority of them were just tumor resections. Um, they did have a breakdown of the specific tumors, but I, I, didn't, um, I don't re recall what they were. Uh, obviously, these excluded um, emergent neurosurgical cases, trauma cases, hemorrhages, things of that sort. Uh, I feel, I feel but, like it, you know, would be, it, it would be an interesting research question to know, you know, DVT prophylaxis on a shunt versus a craniotomy for a malignant tumor versus a skull-based tumor versus a spinal fusion, you know. Sure. And I'm sure nationwide we have the numbers, but we don't have the coordination to pull off that trial at the moment. Yeah. You know, I will say, um, you know, at least for uh, West, when, when we do the scuba cases, you know, we we, um, we have the protocol that we start Lovenox at 24 hours post-op, post-surgical uh, evacuation and, um, you know, we haven't crunched the numbers, but antidotally, you know, I, I haven't really um, noticed any increased bleeding complications, at least in the scuba ICH populations that we have. Uh, I'm not sure if Chris noticed anything, but so far, uh, I really can't recall a patient that I would say, you know, the low Vinox caused the bleed. Yep, that's right. Hey, John, this is Jay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, great. Uh, review and coverage of these uh, topics. When you were reading the Agnelli et al. paper, uh, did you stumble on the extremely erudite letter to the editor of New England Journal commentating on the methodology? 
<laughs> no, I did not. I'm it. going to that. That happened. That happened to be my first publication ever. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I got to say, I think it's a bit of an overcall to the pro Belovinovs in this case. Um, there are some substantial flaws in that Agnelli paper, and the most significantly, mm-hmm. they minimize the bleeding complication statements in terms of what they define. Um, and so it, it actually does look like, and you rightly call it out, the concerns for Lovinoff with the hemorrhagic complications. So I, I, you know, my take on the state of the literature, which is mainly driven by these conclusions, which I think are overstatements, um, is that there really isn't adequate support to promote Lovinoff's over sub heparin, although there may have been progress in the last five, six years that I'm, that I'm not as aware of. Um, and the other thing is that, like, starting except you have in the rest. Sorry for the noise. Um, the when I was at the University of Florida, they were very aggressive about this data, and we would actually put people on sub-Q heparin preoperatively and through surgery. Um, and to be honest, I did not see significant effects except that if you have small uh, elderly women, sometimes you could, they could become truly therapeutic on sub heparin. So you do have to be careful for that. But with regular patients, uh, I'm not saying we should switch to this, but just so everyone has that as a barometer, there are institutions that will have people on sub heparin right up to the, to the day of surgery and afterwards, including ruptured aneurysms. So, just some, some perspective on those things. And just the last thing I'd say is that uh, I think that the is, although we don't have high quality evidence-based indications for it yet, what they have that stroke has never had is that they can immediately assess the pulmonary artery pressures and the right ventricular strain and their immediate correction of those problems. And the reality is, is you can see it right there. It would be like if we could do a functional MRI on the scanner, on the table while we were doing the intervention. Um, and they can affect some pretty dramatic improvements in those physiologic parameters uh, to the point where I think you were spot on that their technology is very primitive right now. But when they get the better technology and they figure this out, it's going to, I believe it will be the standard therapy. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, I think the, the, you know, there's the debate is, you know, is Lovenox or heparin sub-Q, you know, in terms of efficacy of, you know, from non-neurosurgical cases, right, just general MICU, SICU cases, you know, the data is pretty clear that in terms of prevention of DVTs and prevention of HIT, Lovenox is definitely, you know, there's clear level of evidence that it's beneficial and superior to heparin. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I'll be honest, I, I didn't look through all these nine trials that this meta-analysis um, talked about to, to see if the methodology flaws. Uh, so, you know, that is something to, to look into whether or not um, all these trials also had methodology issues with, you know, well, it's a balance. And, uh, it's the balance of the risk profile. So that, I guess that's exactly that's the issue. Uh, and, and it, again, the, the newer data might make this clear, but uh, it doesn't appear to me that we know that that's worth the trade off as of now. And then I don't know if it's still relevant, but is the cost profile still very significant? Because it certainly was in the past. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't think the cost difference is, you know, in the grand scheme of things with, you know, with no surgery and, and the complications of HIT and T- DVTs and PEs, I, I don't think the the few days of Lobanox versus sub sub Q would make a significant difference in our decision making. Uh, I think, it's, as you said, it's really about it is safe for post on no surgical patients, which, you know, I think it's something that uh, we can look into within our own patients. Well, it was a great, great review. Thank you, John. Thank you.
I think it's important to ask, add these analyses of methodology and consider the other aspects to it as well. But very nicely done, John. Thank you. All right, if you want to stop sharing your screen.